You're listening to the Pagan Centered Podcast, bringing unique and intelligent perspective to the masses using contemporary technology, allowing for free discussion of one's personal beliefs and enlightenment of those not familiar with a particular religion. We bring to the forefront many issues that are ignored or shunned upon by mainstream religion. We discuss topics on a religious and non-religious level as they relate to our panel representing varied belief systems. Our brute honesty and candid opinion has made us one of the longest-running and most popular pagan podcasts. Feel welcome to call in live or submit listener feedback via our website, PaganCenteredPodcast.com. DP, the Pagan Centered Podcast. I'm Dave. I'm Amber. (coughs) I'm Scurvy. Also joining us tonight are... I'm Barrett. Yolanda. I'm Lamika of Lamika's Wicked Podcast. I'm Miles. I'm Star of Patheos.com. All right, and tonight we are doing a potluck of questions from AskAPagan.com because, yeah, there's still a lot of them left we haven't answered in like the past 10 weeks, so it's time for us to answer them all and purge the queue. So we'll get back to purging after these messages. And we're back. I feel so much lighter now. (laughs) And there is a Peter in here, and and I think we lost him already. (laughs) So. Blame, blame, Blame Skype. We blame Skype. Yeah, Skype has been messing up for a couple days now. Well, I just like Senna friend invite to Peter on Skype and that uh, probably like you know mm, his Skype account so probably saw here. my Skype account's history and probably just sort of fro- freaked out or something. I don't know. <laughs> There's a Peter in the background. I'm here. Okay. So does somebody want to read Jenny's question? You know, I'm still getting over being sick. I'll grab it. Uh, Go ahead, I have been, okay, Jenny asks, I have been searching for some time for a way to find the connectivity that many spiritual feel with deity in the universe. I know in my head this is all connected, but I do not feel it. I ask everyone that I meet who has this feeling and have yet to find anyone who has developed it. They all say that it was inherently there and that it grew as they became more spiritual. I've tried a number of methods and I'm going on a spirit quest soon with a shaman in my area. I hope this will help, but I am open to other suggestions. Thank you and namaste. Mm, connectivity with spiritual. I don't know. I, I, I say if you don't feel it, don't fake it. I have kind of a suggestion for her. Okay. I mean, if you want to feel that connectivity, you have to first, before you can, you know, breach spiritual you have to first hit physical and mental. So start living a more conscious life, you know, um, start cooking your own meals, start making sure that, you know, when you go shopping, every single thing in your basket um, is exactly what you want to buy. And you know exactly what's it's what it's going to be used for. Um, if you it, it down to, you know, actions that you do every day start using using your mind uh, to consciously go over what you do in a day what you don't do in a day Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, 100% meticulous from the very start but you can start with you know having a, a, a financial journal of your purchases and your receipts you can start having uh, a weekly journal of what you eat, you know, in in uh, in a in a given day, um, you know, things like that that help tie you more into your physical reality, and then you build upon that because it it starts to you start to realize that you have uh, bad habits, good habits, meh habits, um, that. Uh, Things you need to start asking yourself about uh, why you do certain things, why you don't do certain things, and and then it starts to build up towards uh, the spiritual level where, you know, you start to notice because you're living a more conscious life on a on a physical and mental level, you start to notice that you're 
you don't have a spiritual element in your life, um, not in the in- inherent sense, but in the way that you don't actively reach out to deity, for example, whichever deity um, or spirits that you connect with, um, because it's not always going to be them reaching out to you. Um, you know, it's 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 work. You know, do you, you you'll start to question? Hey, wait a second. I don't feel really connected, but do I not do any kind of devotionals? Do I not study? Do I not pray? What do, and then not just the, the negative of, of not, but what do I do? You know, um, uh, yes, I go for a walk once a week, or I do this or that, or, you know, wh- whatever it might be that would help build that spiritual connection. But it starts from that foundation. I don't know. I would take a different approach. I'd say go out, go out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Well, not too far in the middle of nowhere. You want to have cell phone coverage in case shit goes bad. But I would just say go out in the middle of nowhere where there's cell phone coverage. And uh, notice the small things. I mean, for a lot of people, it's just we're, we have so much going on that we just learn to block it out. This is actually a very common thing that is noticed with uh, regards to training people how to listen. Uh, We are trained to ignore a lot of things and the way, you know, yeah, a lot of the same techniques for learning how to listen, you know, uh, you know, regurgitate what the person's saying, all that stuff. Okay, yeah, that's a starting point. But realistically, I would say, in terms of metaphysical, try to notice the small things and connect with I mean, connect with the water moving down a river or, or water rippling down a creek or sunlight shining through the trees and how the, the warmth of the sun. Focus on all the small stuff and try to work smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you might get there. I don't know. It's not for everyone. Not everybody gets there. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's just my take on it. You know, I think I would come from a different direction. You know, she talks about how she wants to connect to deity and the universe, and the universe is really kind of big, <laughs> and 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 it it can seem immense and overwhelming at first. So, it, my suggestion would be, if you know, if she were to to ask me, um, would be to to pick a a, a different deity every week. And, and set aside uh, like 10, 15 minutes every day to do sort of a devotional to that deity and to reach out and try to connect to them. And then maybe next week you, you, you choose a different deity um, to, to, to get uh, the gods to reach out to you. Um, sometimes you have to reach out to them first. So uh, that, that would be my suggestion to try. I know I tried that. It took a long time before I found a... Uh, a strong connection to a particular to a particular god. Um, there were definitely some some gods where you know I really 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 thought they were awesome and it was like nothing. I was I was you know beating my head against the wall. So that's my advice. Well, if it's now just assuming that you've been doing some research on deity and such so far, gather up your books. Stick them in a pile or, or however you choose to do this. Spend a little bit of time and decide, okay, if I have five books here, which ones am I going... Or if I have five books I can keep from here, three books, which ones am I going to keep? Maybe, I mean, it's no guarantee. Maybe that'll be a bit of an inkling where you might want to start looking. Look at your bookshelf. Do you have 50 books on uh, Egyptian deities? Just a long shot. I mean, granted, you might have lucked out in a flea market or something, but you never know. My answer there, I think, to find a connection with this ritual um, is to, let me think, quickly put these thoughts into context, edit this part out, thank you Dave, <clears throat> um, is to um, examine what you're doing, anchor every day 
emotions if you drive to work, if you're at work, if you're whichever it is. Because um, I once heard a wise man say that if you transform work into play, then when these endless actions become enjoyable, and you will have found spirituality in this simplest of things. It's not really about worshipping a god a week. I think you might lose track of who's who and who's doing what. Um, it's more um, of finding out these spirituality of yourself first, then connect that with this actual world out there, because the more the, and your actual self opens up, the easier that will become. Alrighty, since nobody else is speaking, I'll speak. Might be the last <laughs> chance I get for a while. <laughs> well, here's... Especially considering I've been reappraising some aspects of my own spirituality recently. I go out and make friends. I can catalyze some reactions. Uh, speaking of that, they, they should be laughing right about now, but they're not for some reason. I'll get you guys later. But, uh... <clears throat> something else to try? Just immerse yourself in the culture a little bit. I mean, it's... It's hard to say, do this and you will get results. A lot of it is trial and error. See, I don't, I mean, Jenny, I really wish I could spend an hour to sit down with you. I mean, I, I would probably give me an idea, say, hey, this is something you might want to try. But when it comes down to it, we can toss out suggestions. And when I, I, I wish you the best of luck with each of them. And spirit question with shaman in your area, you probably going to have some luck soon anyway, too. But, uh... Man, I'm just rambling. Pointlessly. Somebody stop me. That's not that bad, Scurvy. Yeah. Alright, I'll jump in. Excellent. You know, what you're hearing from a lot of people, and, and Scurvy's kind of on the money, is create some kind of discipline around ritual and around your spiritual practice and just keep doing it. Because... You know, at least my experience for me is that when I put effort into the community or into my beliefs or into spiritual connection, that's when I get it. If it's just a casual thing for me, I don't. If I have some discipline around it, that's when it really starts to affect me and I start feeling it. So again, my best suggestion is have some discipline about doing ritual, about participating in community, about you know practicing your beliefs, walking the talk, and that discipline will lead you to that kind of connection you're looking for. I think going off of a mix between what Peter and Dave said, Dave brought up a really good point when he said we're trained not to see things anymore. And, yeah, there are some areas that are definitely more spiritually active than others. So not every place is going to be the same. And, and if you're not sensitive, telling you to go find a more spiritual place is kind of backwards. But... Places that are, you know, David mentioned, out of, out of the way and far from civilization. Whether it is the ocean, the middle of the woods, a river that doesn't have the city right on the banks. Going out and just sitting there and letting whatever happens happen. And being willing to accept it. Sometimes 
the energy of spirit doesn't come whenever you're trying to hunt it down with a magnifying glass. You have to let it come to you and do what it's going to do in whatever way it wants to. If you're expecting, you know, oh, you want to meditate on this and you're going to get your spirit guide and you expect this huge being to come from the sky and, you know, but a, a little mouse comes up and, and sits on your leg instead. That's all a part of the same thing. And, you know, what, what a couple people have mentioned, looking at the smaller things, no, not everything is going to be some amazing spiritual experience, but if you're willing to accept little things, the big things will eventually come later. And also, you know, patience. You know, nothing hap not many things in this world happen at the snap of your fingers. And um, having a having patience definitely is is a, a big part of developing that discipline that Peter was talking about. You know, patience with yourself. You know, patience with the speed that things are going, and knowing you know not when not to be patient about you know so that you can encourage better discipline uh, in your practices about, you know, connecting with, uh, with the universe. Well, it might also be possibly that you could be trying too hard. Like if you're asking everyone else how they got where they are, like their path might not be the one you need to follow. This is also true. <laughs> You know, if, if nature isn't working for you, there's nothing wrong with going to a church just out of curiosity. If nothing else is working, it's worth a shot. I have had some intensely spiritual experiences in Christian churches um, until the minister got up to the pulpit. <laughs> but let me tell you what, visiting some Pentecostal ladies, those ladies, all they need is the campfire to be pagan. They're fun. They are fun. My favorites are the ones who come in on the walkers, and the next thing you know, they're like dancing in the aisles. I love it. That's kind of cool. I almost want to see that. Well, if in my view, if you're trying to feel more spiritually, you should do good things for your spirit. Like, um, for your your own soul, I mean, not the, the great spirit or whatever you want to call it. You should go out to nature, like you guys were saying. You should do art. You should um, learn at every turn. Like, good things for your own soul will open yourself up to something more. That's the way I see it. That's a really good point, Barrett. Yeah. You know, even if you have... Yeah, going out and, you know, nature is spirit and spirit is nature and everything like that. But if you have a calling to do, like, healing, and sometimes you see nature in working with the human body and fixing the human body, and you see spirit in fixing the human body, it's not necessarily that you have to go out and and baptize yourself in the river every day, it's that you found spirit somewhere else. So, yeah, I can see that. Not the to topic jump, but I just read the next one, and I really wish I would have slept before doing this. <laughs> So while the, the inner circle chat room goes on about Sprite and Pudding and me and uh, Gutrich talking about smartphones in the outer chat room, let's get on to the <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> Chastity asks, so a friend recently found out that I am a pagan. You, you. 
and asked my opinion about something when she was nine years old, to be exact. Someone broke into her house and took down all the photos of her, arranged them in a circle, lit a candle in the middle, and then sprinkled broken glass in a larger circle around it. What could this mean? Could this be some obscure <coughs> ritual? The memory of this has always given her to creeps, and she has very negative feelings towards it. I have never heard of a ritual like this, but I cannot deny that it sounds very ritualistic. I have read somewhere that broken glass has meaning to the gypsy traditions, but I cannot remember what exactly. I'm aware you guys in no way can know to every ritual out there, since most are individual to each practitioner, but does this ring any bells? My friend is very open-minded about things in general, but admitted that this has always made her very wary of us, and I like, like to put her mind at ease. Thanks so much, Chastity. Okay, but I don't have a lot to say on this, so I'm just going to toss in my two cents worth. If I had a nine-year-old daughter, that sounds like the kind of protection spell I would do. I mean, uh, a shield of broken glass is a pretty strong shield. I, I That's my two cents worth. But other than that, I think it just sounds weird. Yeah, especially taking down all the photos of her. It's like, is she trying to hide her from something? Come on, break it. And she says that someone broke into the house and did that. Not a family member. Somebody else broke in, arranged all the pictures, and then proceeded with the ritual. So it's somebody else who wanted entry into the house, unless it was someone who breaks in for the purpose of casting protective magics. One would think that if you're breaking in then anti magics aren't what's on your mind. Um, unless it's someone who's not allowed in the house but does have the child's best interests in mind, like an uncle who isn't allowed in for some reason. Um, broken glass, all the pictures in a circle, candle in the middle. Um, I don't you quite know, know if... Hmm? Sorry, go on. With, the, with the breaking in thing, though, I mean, she's remembering this from when she was nine. When I was nine, I thought a guy in a red suit broke into our house every year and left me presents. <laughs> so, so I mean, like the circumstances that she may remember or have been told about it, that's that's from when she was nine. and Right, because we don't know how old she is now if it was nine years ago when she's 18, or if it was... If it was 39 years ago. Um, yeah, but either way, I mean, you don't necessarily mess up something uh, that traumatic as, you know, somebody... Having somebody break into your house is something that children don't forget. Whether or not they see I, it themselves or because they're adults, they're, you know, they're, their parents or, or family members... Or police will come to the house. So it's not something that you can so easily say, like, oh, maybe she's just forgetting how it really went down. Well, I'm actually thinking as well, though you don't have all the details here, it says that she remembers that someone broke into the house, did this thing with the pictures and the candle and the glass, and then what? Did somebody else find all these things there? Did this person arrange all these and then leave again through the, let's assume, broken window? Did, was it left there to be found by family members? Did they take all these things away again but somebody saw it? If the person who broke in arranged all these things and left them there to be found, my inclination here is that it was not a break-in, it was somebody in the house already trying to do this, and then used the broken window as an alibi so they wouldn't be seen as the one who did this thing. It just seems weird to break in a house with a candle and some broken glass already and do that. I mean, breaking and protecting spells is not a very common crime I hear of. <laughs> exactly, that's my point. But, um, leads me to think, really, that it was somebody in the house, like a, a brother, father, some family member as well, who thought this might be a wise idea, but 
everyone else thinks it's bad, but he really wants to go for it, and so he does this, and then the broken window is his alibi of non-culpability. Yeah, or, or it's a stalker. It, hmm? it, I mean, it could have been a stalker. Going off of what Miles said, it could have been somebody actually broke into the house, and a family member put that down. Ah, would and the, then said, no, no, that was there, I found it. Would so the broken, well, would the broken window and then the arranged circle be unrelated? Someone in a circle and someone broke into the house. Just by chance, if they're seen at the same time, they were assumed to be related incidents. I don't no? see anything about a broken window in here. No, no, no. It does, well, someone broke into the house. It doesn't say how they broke in. It just says broken into the house. I'm just extrapolating broken window as a way to also provide broken glass. That's just my assumption. I don't know. Trying to get broken glass clumped together is a pain in the ass. Well, yeah. We also don't know the, the state of this girl that is being talked about when she was a child, whoever that person is, we don't know the state of her her life and what's going on. I mean, usually what? you can tell, I mean, broken glass around pictures can either be, oh, can either be um, protection magic or it can be a, a curse against the family, whether by an actual real practitioner or some psychotic stalker who thought it would mess with the, you know, the family's heads or, um, that's true. Was it like some, some supposed to freak out the family prankish trick, like springs, plasticas on the garage door or something? Yeah, and there's and there's that as well. You know that this is somebody's um, prank, some shitty prank that yeah. somebody does. Um, they also don't mention. Nothing. They also don't mention the time of year. I mean, if this is happening around, like, April 1st, or if it's happening around Halloween, then it yeah. sounds much more like a prank than if it happened, you know, in the middle of November. Right? Yeah. It sounds an awful lot like a Christine O'Donnell dabblegate. <laughs> Some teenager. <laughs> like, it's, it's so well, hard to say with that little information, even though it's a lot that she remembers, it's still, in a ritual term... So much, sm like it's it's a teeny tiny itty bitty minuscule bit of the picture. Well, so, well, from what I can find, trying to look up rituals and looking through the books I have and stuff, it would also depend like what the glass is from, because if it was like m a mere glass, that would be more of a curse. And and different colored glasses have different meanings for summer protection, summer. At least if it's actually the uh, gypsy connection. And the candle color as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, since we don't know that much about it, though, I'm inclined to think that it was... I really think it was meant as some kind of a prank or a let's freak out this... this um, let's freak out the neighbor's kid thing. I'm not, I'm well, personally not seeing much in the way of legitimate magical work here. I mean, the break-in is, like, um, unethical. What I was, idea I was kicking around on this was somebody saw something similar to this done, which would explain a structure. Later on, they said, well, I'm going to be a stupid adolescent and I'm going to go break into their house and do that to them because I know their parents are not there or impaired or whatever. Because, hmm. quite frankly, looking at it, breaking into a house is a ballsy thing to do if you know anybody is there. I'm not sure if we have to beep that word or not. No. Then you got to well, and you're going to sit there, there is... gather pictures, and if you know people are there, I mean, I, that's, I take some balls, or Darren, or however you want to call it. You're going to gather the pictures, 
light a candle, arrange them, broken glass. I mean, that's... If I'm seeing someone that's got enough gall and bravado or whatever you want to call it, or, or whatever, to do something like that, well, yeah, I could, I could sign off say, making the assumption that yeah, this is something they saw elsewhere, and they're just doing it for kicks. You know, you know, she also didn't mention if she had siblings or not, and um, having two older sisters and a younger brother that I, I tortured mercilessly uh, growing up. Um, I know that sometimes sibling pranks can be very elaborate. Um, I come from a pranking family. So, you know, if she has siblings, that that would probably be the first place I would look. Right. And the broken window is the alibi. Or the, whatever the broken entry passage form was. Uh, my thing here is how would a random person know where all the photographs are? Or know where any photographs are for that. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, well photographs are easy to find. You go to the living room, you check the hallways. I mean, that's... Yeah. Well, and there's... All the boxes of pictures under the bed and in, in the box in the closet and all those things. If it's all the pictures, then it's a person who knows the house well, like a person who lives there. I'm thinking prank as well, personally. In fact, um, I think the line here is, this myth is busted. <laughs> oh, the part that it gets me is if it's an inside job probably a sibling if it's not an inside job I'd probably say if, I guess an associate of family because that that takes a lot of gall to do I mean you and planning right and planning you know I mean that's got to be a lot of fucking glass I mean glass can rot well well, I mean, your average picture frame is like three by five, like a three by five card, or around that size. To make a circle of that, you have a, you know, and then to make another circle of broken glass around that, that's a lot of freaking glass. Well, I mean, not as much as you think. Uh, say someone had a car accident, and there's all that broken glass by the side of the road. There we go. Which goes back to Alanda's thing: where'd the glass come from? Yeah. I'd bring it with me. I mean, let's, let's assume hypothetically I, I got the gall to go break and enter into, uh, we'll say, Dave's house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Consider Dave's a Texan. That gives him pretty good odds of having a gun and just not being out of the closet about it already. I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable grinding up glass. I can, beans in someone's I can, house. I mean, I, I, no. I can confirm he has a t-shirt that says don't make me consecrate my gun. Huh. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I mean, technically, if we're looking at, if we are looking at the logistics of it, just, just the logistics, if it, if you took the picture frames and they did have glass, you know, and, it, and like most picture frames do, and for each of those pictures, they broke the glass, you know, then you technically would have enough glass, you know, mm-hmm. That's still to go around the frames. Noise, though. I mean, yeah, that's the other thing. If I she mean, remembers it, I mean, I, I even just putting the glass on the ground makes a lot of noise. That's true, but you know, Dave said this earlier. We've been trained to ignore a lot of shit. I mean, I've seen people, yeah, not but, even yeah, just us. Know that everybody's gonna think their window is the one that's broken when they hear glass shatter. I mean, it happens all the time around here when we've got builders over here. Yeah, but I mean, people might ignore things, yes, but. People are, and I hate to say this, but I mean, if you're sleeping and you hear something going on like breaking glass, you will wake up. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's... Well, not okay, all let me Let me ask you this. I mean, the point I'm saying is I don't, if they did this, I don't think they broke the glass in their house. I think they brought it with them. Yeah, you know, if it is sort of a, a witchy sort of ritual, if if it is an intentional ritual, it, it sort of makes sense that, that they would have prepared ahead of time, 
You know, if, if you don't want to wake up people, then you have the glass prepared and ready and something where you can just shake it out into a circle and you already know where the pictures are that you're looking for and you've got your candle ready and you're not fumbling with a lighter and, and cussing as you burn your thumb. So, <laughs> so that part of it does sort of make it sound like this was something that was definitely, you know... But what if ahead. it's an unintentional ritual? They were just breaking and entering. And then they're like, they, they're like, how do we keep this girl from moving? We'll put pictures of her around her. Don't go outside the pictures. But she might actually, like, not listen to us. Okay, let's put some broken glass around that. Yeah, but how will she know the glass is there when it gets dark? I don't know. Let's light a candle. <laughs> you know what? That is pretty funny. Like, you have to, and, and this also might come down to somebody was breaking and entering, broke a couple of, you know, pictures picture frames or whatever and there's glass on the ground and then they go oh man that shit would be funny if i you know and then they do it and some little girl grows up freakishly afraid of pagans and it's just some douchebag burglar who thought it would be hilarious to just you know fuck you know like uh, uh, you know like uh what, what's that one movie uh dick and jane where they get the the voice modification things and then they go to that one guy's house and they're robbing him and they're doing all those weird funky like lines because they have the voice modification things on their throats and they're just fucking with him just because it's funny did nobody see that movie nope oh, oh I hate all of you it was funny no. <laughs> I, I have a question for you guys though there's one thing that we haven't talked about in what she asked, which is this this friend of hers has admitted uh, that because of this incident, it's always made her a bit weary of pagans. Uh, oh, that's weary. That should be wary. But, sorry. Uh, wary of pagans. So, is she right to be wary of pagans? I don't know. If a Baptist, you know... You know, broke into my house and hung me up on a pole and then dipped me in a pool and said, Praise Jesus! I'd be a little freaked out if I was nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good point, Dave. <laughs> Ambush baptism. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably happened. I mean, even as an adult, you know? Not just in, in this particular instance, but... It, should people be wary of pagans or or not even pagans it, it, people who practice uh magic but you know being of my own temperament which is probably of no help whatsoever to your question um i would actually think that it would make her more interested i would be wanting to figure out what happened um but that's just me i i like to research things and um I'm already of the occult leaning. I can un I can understand being leery, but at the same time, you know, like Star saying, it could give you a lot of insight into what happened. If you ask the right person, they might be able to give you insight or tell you that, you know, just like we're saying, oh, I don't know. Could be good, could be unrelated, I don't know. So basically this person did ask someone who asked someone smarter than them. We're all like, we don't know, ask someone else. But going and experiencing them, if you have another bad experience and you get turned away, okay, fine. But one bad experience doesn't make us all bad. The person who so. did this sounds, sounds like they're completely crazy. That's That should go without saying, like. Prank or not, humans are lazy creatures these days. So if it was done in the last 10 years, 20 years even, this person must have had something tweaked to do all this work just to mess with someone. <laughs> just putting that out there into the universe. You know, Vera makes a good point. Literally, if it had been done in the past 10 years, somebody would have filmed her reaction and put it on YouTube. Yep. Did you piss someone off and was their name Eric Cartman? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we've gotten really, really lazy. If somebody went through all of that, it's it's kind of like crack, the fresh maker, because nobody has that kind of focus except for when they're doing some sort of drug or they're like the CEO of a company. I don't know. 
or both? I, you know, I, I'm still sort of of the opinion that it was it was some sort of protection spell done by a relative, by someone who loved her, and wasn't meant to find it. And so the explanation that was given to her was, oh my goodness, I guess someone broke in and did that. Or it could have been a Christian relative trying to turn her away from some paganish leanings early on. Yeah, because doing rituals is a really good way to do that. I, I often baptize people to, to make Well, honestly, I'm if sorry, I... I'm sorry, <laughs> if, if, You walked right into that one, dude. I was 10 years sorry. old and saw someone break in and all that that stuff go on, I would have no idea what that is. I'd be like, oh, that's kind of freaky. I'm going to stay away from these people. I mean, it, would have been you pegged. know, going off what Barrett said, if somebody, maybe not even the child, but maybe the... It depends on again circumstance. We could, we could really <laughs> make hypotheses on what happened all night. Yeah. PCB <laughs> Lord Order Edition. Dun dun. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I mean, yeah. it could be a grandparent, and the mother was pagan, and the grandparent wanted to scare the kid away, or it, it could be tons and tons of different things. The basics is we don't have enough information to say. You know what? Maybe. It, you know, we don't know enough about this, this girl. I mean, Amber, everybody, you know, everybody's talking about this is right, because what if this is some sort of weird Ola intervention type thing to get the child to always stay away from weird stuff and pagan weirdos and da-da-da-da, you know? I've seen parents do crazier shit, so... <laughs> Yeah, Why well, not? If this was done during a satanic pagan, pa- let's see, a satanic so, panic. There we go. You know, as as maybe the family is trying to get some being attention horse. Yeah, because you know we you don't, don't. Yeah, like, in my incidents that totally worked perfectly fine. Because the, time, nah. the timing would be right, and you know, early eighties, late eighties, whatever. I mean, that's the whole satanic panic era, and people did some really whacked out crap back then. They they did. They did. My That's parents true. were totally into that and they totally believed it and and it all backfired on them, unfortunately. <laughs> Poor things. <laughs> uh. You know, my take on this is that uh, you know, aside from whether or not you should be concerned about pagans or not, any time that you develop a phobia when you're nine years old and you're carrying that into adulthood, that's something to take a look at. Well, whether it's spiders or whether it's somebody broke glass around your pictures or whatever it is, that there's some issues there that they need to deal with if they're going to find a spiritual path for themselves. Because if it prevents them from looking in a specific direction, they're excluding a whole set of belief systems as something they can consider because of a phobia, which I don't think sounds like it's something they should be carrying around in adulthood. As everybody decides to type instead of actually say anything. <laughs> I'm You're panting. welcome. Yes, yes, Peter does have a really good point. He does. Mm-hmm. Happens once a century. Mm-hmm. Is it just me, or is all of us, like, really, really negative the past couple of days? We're sure we're really no, we aren't so tired. <laughs> End of it all, hush. <laughs> well, um... I'm sick, star sick. A lot of people... I have sick. green goo. Ew. Green goo. It makes me happy. Well, I haven't been able to see properly green for the past two days, so... Well, that's, that. that's not bad. Yes, it does, Scurvy. It's a pretty green color. Green goo makes star happy. It's the delirium setting in. She's the medication hasn't come in yet. Thank you for that visual. I can go to sleep by. Okay, so now that we've scarred scurvy, let's move on. <laughs> Night child I- says I've seen a lot of criticism about pagan teachers charging for lessons. A lot of people say that pagan teachers should not charge for it. Should it charge for what? Oh, a lot of people. <laughs> I was like, this sounds really stupid, but that's what they said. A lot of people say that pagan teachers shouldn't charge for their time and efforts. 
why is it worse than paying for a workshop or paying uh, public and private school teachers? Well, you already know my opinion on this because I couldn't quite read your question because I thought that not paying pagan teachers was a dumb idea. I like pay, pay, paying teachers. Teachers, especially for, if it's just for the time or the effort. I, I, you know, where I'm coming from, that's there's nothing against the religion for doing that. And and it's I think not people just, just time and effort. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, let me go. I was just gonna say it's it's not just time and effort. You know, when you to prepare for that lesson or or the time it in that lesson or or, or reading or whatever. It's also the years of studying that go into it you know so it's it's hell yeah pay shit well you know the whole the whole prohibition really kind of started with the with seeing uh clergy and teachers from other religions um you know abuse that and uh you know the televangelists who you know were asking for for money and and that sort of thing and and so that's sort of where it came from, but we've sort of come to this weird spot now in our in our evolution where, you know, now we're actually starting to build temples and stuff, and, you know, we're starting to do things that all of a sudden, oh dear, this requires money, and, and part of that's, you know, uh, financially supporting our, our teachers and our spiritual leaders, um, and, you know, I, I don't... I, I I will admit that I am a fence sitter on this issue. You know, if if people are doing it honestly and with integrity, I don't have an issue with it. But my tradition doesn't do that. And um, and yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, charging for lessons is a great way of filtering out the chuck full of fail of. I want to be called a witch, and I don't want to do any of the work. Well, I yeah. Mean, there are... I've seen a lot of times where um, I was told that, oh, you know, true elders don't ever charge, and that's how you tell, uh, especially in the Native community, that's how you tell plastic shamans is if somebody charges. And I've found that it's more than just money charging. And I actually just put in the chat room, people also went crap for free. And this is exactly it. They don't understand that, you're taking time that this person is supposed to be doing work to provide for their family. You're taking the time that this person's supposed to be cooking dinner to pay for their family. You're taking away their time and you're not wanting them, you're not, what are you giving them in return? This is not, well, because you want it, you should be given it. And if you can't afford it, there's enough of teachers that I've seen that are willing to barter back and forth for something else. Some kind of trading, whether you do garden work for them or something else. So it's not always monetary, but yeah, they they really should get some kind of compensation, even if it's giving them cookies. I don't know. Or repairing their computer. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a sacrifice that you would give a deity for assisting you. Like, are you just going to expect your deity to just drop everything and work on your problems? Or are you going to try and grease the wheels with something and entice them to help you? Or like, look, if you do this, I give you this offering, please help me. It's the same thing. You you know, one thing that that Amber sort of said, um, kind of touched on, is that, you know, if you get something for free, you're like, you know, awesome, it's free. And if you have to pay for it, you tend to ask more questions. Um, if somebody's going to charge me for a class, then I'm going to find out more about them. Um, mm-hmm. And I've done that with workshops that I've I've paid for, uh, where, where teachers have come in from out of town. But um, Yeah, but at the same time, you go to a college, you can always look up the full history of a professor nowadays, so... Right. I mean, that's just par for the course. That's why they have credentials. Mm-hmm. Right. But then, you know, I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm sort of ambivalent about it because, you know, we do a lot of delegation in my tradition, and everyone in my tradition has, you know, full-time jobs, whether you're a student or, or, or a teacher or leader or, or high priestess or whatever. And uh, and when when we do donate money and stuff, it it, it goes towards things that the, the community needs. And um, I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 
Oh, it's, it's, I can't it's, endorse it's, it. It's the PSG economy. You still got to pay to get in. That eliminates a lot of the fail. But in order for that you know, town to survive, everybody needs to contribute four hours of work a week. And that's how that little miniature economy thrives. Once a year. Well, it, Alan, please. Well, it's not that much different from like it, you know, instead of doing apprenticeships and donating your time to, like Amber said, you know, gardening and helping out around the house or giving your things to a temple you were joining, which, you know, don't really do that a lot anymore. But in the modern world, you like it's the modern adaptation. Information is free, but you work on the time that the teachers provide is their work and their time, which deserves compensation. Um, I think that if you want someone to drive or fly halfway across the country to teach at your workshop, they should be paying the expenses due, of course. Um, I sometimes teach as well, but I don't live off my teaching. I have a day job, and so I don't expect much compensation for my teaching. Um, if it was my full-time career, that would be absolutely indifferent. I think the other kind of the equation is the is the bad rap some people have gotten by living off the emotions of people. So they ask all this money for classes and things, and then they don't really teach much at all. They just, they just live off it and then and teach them a thing or two, blah, blah, just the basics, okay, bing, now you're a witch, goodbye. And there really should be more to it than that. Well, let's look at the uh, pros and cons of this real quick from the teacher's point of view. Let's say I'm a teacher, as everybody well, wants himself. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and I'm charging for lessons. And I'm living off of these uh, this tuition. I want you coming back all the time. Okay, I got the gift of Babel. Trust me. I can stretch this out. Now, on the other hand, say I'm doing this for free. The price you're paying, for paying then, is one, I want this done in the least amount of time possible to do it properly. Two, you get to put up with my charming personality. But at the same time, I think a lot of people I always for the free teachers are also all the first ones to be like, Oh my god, these people are claiming to be teachers and they're abusing our young. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I think one part of this whole uh, like debate that's gone on for eons now um, that that some people miss is that just because someone isn't t charging for what they're teaching, that doesn't mean that they're not abusing their students in other ways. Of course. Um, you know, it, I, I know you you do pay your teachers in like the Santeria community and. To, to be um, initiated into Santeria can, can cost you a lot of money. I, I was shocked at how much money it, it will eventually cost you. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I've, I've worked with teachers who didn't charge me anything. Um, you know, I, I invested in the community and, and that sort of thing. Um, brought things to potlucks, you know, helped pay for things that the, the group needed. But, uh, but they didn't charge me money for teaching, but that didn't mean that they were not in some way taking advantage of me. So so money isn't the only way that the, the student-teacher relationship can go wrong. Um, and, and I think people forget that. I think a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the money, and they forget that, you know, there's, there's other issues out there, too. Well, one thing I also want to jump in here is we get a lot of this. A lot of this is documented in books, and usually a lot of paying groups disagree with the mentality of don't pay people to teach you. I mean, it's like, oh, it's okay to teach, you know, pay someone to teach you. That's fine. But don't you think it's a little self-serving to the authors who wrote this and published this in books that everybody is now reading? Don't pay to get knowledge anywhere else. Just pay me for my books. Mm. Well, here's something else. If you're going to ask a teacher to teach you, 
at least be prepared to the point where it's efficient with their time. Okay, if you're going for lessons there, you should already know how to read. They shouldn't have to teach you down to that basics. You should at least have a clue what you're doing. I mean, and if you don't have a clue whatsoever, that's when you more go and you ask him for advice. Spend some time reading some books. Learn the vocabulary. Pal around with people. Whatever. But I to ask somebody or, or continue. I was just saying, going off of what you're you're saying kind of reminded me. I think that looking, if you're looking for teachers, sometimes the right ones will pop up, but you also have a lot of opportunity to find the wrong ones that are looking to take advantage of you. If you have it in your head that you need a teacher and you go searching for one, there's a lot of people out there that sound and look like good teachers, especially if you're not familiar with what is actually going on, that will happily take your money over charge and not think a second thing about it. Right. So Absolutely. Some, sometimes it's better to just let the right teacher find you and go with it. This is what I've been thinking about in this conversation is, what if you turn this on the head and the question isn't, should teachers charge, but should you pay that teacher to teach you? Because if everybody that you're learning from in your path is somebody you're paying, that's something you should probably look at yourself about. You want to participate in community. I've gone to things where I've paid to be there, but I also have friends in the community. I have people who are my teachers who are my friends. And should I pay somebody? What do they know? It's really my responsibility. I'm the one spending the money. It's not on the teacher whether or not they charge, but whether or not I want to give them my money. Yeah. It's a much healthier way of looking at it. I like that point of view. I'd like yeah. to apply it elsewhere as well, but <laughs> I don't think that would go over too well. I mean, mm. and, and plus also, if it, if you know that you're paying this teacher off the bat, and you got to figure out how much or if you're paying this teacher, gotta be a little bit more wary about who you're gonna let teach you. Mm-hmm. Not like, oh my god, I found a teacher. Yeah, yeah, you found him on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Craigslist is not the place to go find pagan teachers. Well, here's a novel idea as well. If, since we're on the topic of teachers. See if they have other students. Now, if you if you see their other students and their students are full of fail, I'm not telling you and they're probably not full of to fail give this too. teacher their money. You but know if, that's. <laughs> but if three out of the five students in the class are wearing fairy wings. Do you well, want to introduce share themselves as 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 Moon Rabbit of the Go Go Goya tradition? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that that that's a good point. You know, if if your teacher, if you mention to them that you would like to meet their other students and they have an issue with it, that then that's that's probably an issue. Um, I I regularly get hijacked by my my priestess and priests when they go to meet a new student because they always bring a current student along. Not like a second degree, not a first degree, but someone who's way down at the bottom of the totem pole like I am so that they can talk to someone who's currently taking uh, classes and, and get an idea of what it's like to be, a, to be a, a peon like me. And again, here's another thought to look at as well. I mean... Let's say you look at their t this teacher's students, and they're all like lawyers and doctors, and they're they're, they're well to do in life. And they'd say, "Hey, I, I've been going here forever. I might be worth shelling out for." I mean, I know Wait it sounds tack. Or pardon? Wait a minute. I pay them, and then I might become a lawyer. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I see what you're saying there, but... After you learn, though, if you've been going there forever and you're still going there. True. Eventually, you have to graduate. That's a really good point in counseling to have a thing that they talk about where you do a contract with somebody. If they don't achieve what they need to achieve in six months or whatever, then they need to move on. And I think there's some truth in that in spiritual teachers, too, is, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish? What is it you're trying to learn? And are you now their student for the next 20 years giving them money? Do they have students like that? Or have all their students moved on to something else after being happy with their experience? I guess it depends on tradition, right? I mean, if you're talking, well, I mean, obviously it depends on tradition, but I mean, there are, what is it? Uh, I can't, my memory's not the greatest right now, but uh, I was talking with some of my Thelemite friends and how, you know, if you, you go to one lodge or camp and if you say that you're going to start training, they give you three years. And if it lasts longer than three years, then your name is on file and they're not going to be working with you again unless you so you show some serious you know hauling ass of, of what's going on because they they have a they put their foot down they have a limit you know and then you also have other arrangements where you know for hawaiian beliefs that if you have that lineage that heritage you will be with that person until the moment they they pass from this life you will be with your teacher or, or your other um, teachers within that family until they're gone, and you are the 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 top level, the top tier of that, and you have your students uh, who will wait and you know who will be with you until the day you pass, and and so on and so forth. So I don't know. What I was more getting at is, look at their students. Are they full of win or are they full of fail? Are you looking at people that got their life together? Or are you looking at people that Have a might hard time make assistant? Their shoes. Yeah, might make assistant manager. At McDonald's. Yeah. I mean, that's... I know we said it before, but any and finding and looking at any person, especially if you're new, is really intimidating, and it's it's hard to say. You know, if you're not used to what an actual pagan is all about, it's very easy to get duped over by people who talk very pretty. And there's enough of episodes where we've talked about what to look for in a leader and a teacher and and things like that, so... Well, I mean... To borrow another uh, rule book to go by for a moment, one of the rules of the internet, lurk more. Get involved with community. Get to meet the people. Find the standards. Get the gossip. It's not always bad, a bad thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we all know the problems with gossip, but if 100 people say this person's full of win, might want to think about it. Not a guarantee. We already we know that. <clears throat> we know that always, but if 100 people say this person's full of lose and they give you convincing argue, or convincing reasons and yeah sorry got some people know that chat. some people know that there's one born every minute and they're always on the lookout for a new sap Mm-hmm. So it's wise to know who you want to have teaching you. That's why you should, if possible, check credentials. Um, get get cross reference. Ask their other students if they're worth, if they're good teachers or not. Um, and look for basic ground rules on the net. Get some basis of information about what you want to learn about first. Um, then they would fine-tune it, I think. Um, if you wanted to learn about 
about let's say um um <clears throat> um plumbing then um you were trying trying a teacher who's got some basic knowledge of plumbing, not someone who just rattles off about the new fixtures he has on his faucet because they're pretty. Good point. All right, I guess this topic's dead. Moving along. <laughs> Anonymous if, asks us. I've been practicing okay. for about five years now, and dedicated for three. I feel like I've exhausted the usefulness of Pagan and Wiccan 101 books for anything but reference. What do you suggest for an intermediate Pagan? I, I, I think that you should make sure that you very carefully label yourself in all stages of your journey. Um... If you buy, like, a robe that's got things, like, marked off in ounces, that will help you figure out when you reach your goal. And I'm not being snarky at all. Sorry. I'm full <laughs> snarky this night. Um, what, well, what's the definition of May 6 and intermediate study? Are they... On with um, the names of the Greek pantheon versus the names of the Norse pantheon. Are they wanting to move on to carbon dynamics and inter carbon relationships? Or are they wanting just to get more in touch with, with knowing what all the elements mean? There's different levels or different um, grades grades of each person's magical progression. Um, if, let's see, one of books for anything but reference, I guess that means they've got the... All these things are on the altar, all the basic stones everyone uses are these, these herbs are for this and that, and they're on to something and more meat. I suppose. Um, I would recommend their Calvin Craft. Um, I would say she's probably graduated beyond Scott Cunningham's books. Um, and, um, let's see. Who is it? Ebra Lip? Ebra something? Um, has Witchcraft 202, I think it's called. Yeah, Deborah Lip, it's uh, Isaac Bonowitz's uh, ex-wife. First wife, yeah. Yeah. First yeah. wife, I think. So, anyway. Yeah, first wife. Anyway. Um, so, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm going to make an... Hey, I'll try again. Those two failed. What's your recommendation of a meteor book? Peter. You know what? I don't have a recommendation for a meteor book. In, in this case, you know, we all have these huge libraries of all the intro to Wicca, intro to Paganism 101, and then it becomes about learning from each other and learning from teachers. And for me, frankly, it becomes about going back to the beginning, going out in the woods and putting my hands on the tree. Uh, th this person is, is expressing something we've all expressed, and that's that there just isn't enough advanced stuff on this subject out there. And I think that's true. But I also think that those things happen in covens. Those things happen in groups. Those things happen at festivals. Uh, you learn those things by participating in the community. And I'm not sure that you're really going to get that deeper meaning once you get beyond the basic intro books. And one thing that um, you know, I don't think we've ever touched on in this show ever is unverified post personal gnosis. I mean, that's also another source of information that people will tap into, um, you know, just to figure out stuff, which we probably should do a whole episode on. 
On new PGs? Yep. That'd be um, fun. I, I've actually got a friend who has started a... Um, oh, there's actually like a tech term for it. You guys probably know what it is. Where people can submit their UPG and people can vote it up or down. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have right to try to find PG. the link and share it. Wow. But his, his idea is, you know, hey, if 20 people agree with you, then then maybe there's something to what you're saying. And if everybody votes yours down, then maybe you're you're just full of it. But he knows right, though, Hank, that um, once you've learned all the basic things in books, is to come out into nature and begin to teach yourself. I think that after you've learned to play the guitar well, then you go and practice for yourself and develop your own sound. Right? I think that's definitely true, but at the same time, that next intermediate step might not necessarily be a um, religious one, uh, in the sense where it's not opening up a, a 201 or a 301 book, but it might be opening up uh, texts where you can do cro you know cross reference analysis, opening up to historical references, or um, even doing you know interfaith uh, readings and work, so that you have you can have your own uh, comparative analysis with with what is going on. Um, not everybody is going to if we're talking specifically about. Wicca 101, I hate to say it, but you're not really going to find a 201 or a 301 for the next probably 50 years. It's just too young. Um, and if you're saying, well, I'm not a Wiccan, I'm a pagan, well, then there's a whole host of things that you can keep learning and, and keep going. I mean, there, there's so many different uh, pagan cultures out there in, in this world. Uh, you you don't have to be a you know an Asatruar to start studying about them because you want to expand your understanding of what's going on in the greater um, understanding of the word pagan. You do, you know does that make any kind of sense? I actually think that after you've learned all the basics of things, then the next step. I would suggest is to specialize and fine-tune what you know into the angle and the craft and the magics that you want. Um, so look for books with, with a focus that appeals to you and follow that path. You, you know, I would just like to toss out there, you know, I'm... I'm a notorious scrump when it comes to the, the labels uh, beginning in advanced book and stuff like that. But there are some interesting books out there. Like Chris Penzak's got an interesting series of books. I don't agree with everything in them, but they're they're, they're interesting and they've got a little That's more meat on their bones. And some of the older books, stuff by uh, Gardner and Valiente reading, uh, you know, uh, Aradia. So there, there's a lot of stuff from our history that's good to read. And then there's also... Um, People like T. Thorne Coyle and Kat McMorgan, who are actually writing really interesting books that, that aren't your, your basic stuff that's worth taking a look. So it, it, there, if you dig, you can find some stuff. It's just there's not a lot out there, and you genuinely have to dig for it. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the sad thing is, is that when you do find some of these advanced books, if you actually look at their table of contents, it's actually just a proper one-on-one book. It's, yep. it's just, just a proper 101 book instead of an advanced book. And, uh, and yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm actually, the, the whole 101 thing, I've, I'm actually, I, I just finished a series of classes, 101 classes. I'm taking them again. I'm taking them again because, you know, that, that information is still good, and I've had a year to have further insights and... So I'm going through the classes again and sitting in the back and taking notes. And um, for, for me, it's not so much for looking for something new, but going it deeper into what I've already got. Oh, by the way, um, Tar, I'm 
try again. I'm taking in class on Cherry Hills how many right now on Life and Works of Doreen Valiente and your work is included in the courses I'm supposed to read. That is terrifying, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that's be awesome. It I'm really not going to be able to sleep tonight, hmm? Miles. It's, that's terrifying. It's on the writing of the charge and her accusations that that Gardner ripped off from from Hillenden Crowley. Oh yeah. Her reading in Cherry Hill is your work. So there, congratulations. See, oh. Don't worry, Star. It's not like PCP made it onto your reading list. You know what, though? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't people. know about that? I thought you had. <laughs> Trust me, Dave. Any day now, Cherry Hill's going to be calling you, asking you to teach pagan podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought about doing very detailed show notes for our readers, but I figured the person who normally complains frequently about my grammar would drive to Pennsylvania and pop my head like a zip. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you know when you're a path? When you, oh, how do you know when you find your path? When none of the paths seem right. Yet you still want to find a path to spiritual life. Any suggestions on how to proceed? Well, the way I am tackling this question right now with Scurvy is I'm dragging in the PSG. And we're going to take the grand tour of pagan religion at PSG. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to unmute the mic before I <laughs> utter a sentence. <laughs> no, I'm, actually, I'm actually going to be really horrible and ask Dave to repeat that. The question or my answer? Oh, oh. It was, I'm sorry. Never mind. But Dave well, just, we just gave a shortened version of keep looking. Or, One's or, or, out there. I'm just saying, you know, go to a place that has a lot of pagan religion. I like PSG because you can go there. There's about 800 people and probably five different pagan bands represented there in some way, shape, or form. So it's like a buffet of paganism. And sooner or later, you're going to find something that clicks with you. Or at least you're going to find ingredients of things that you like. You know, I've got a friend who uh, who advocates that you speed date pagan groups. That you just <laughs> you oh, go there I do that with the local pagan groups. I, I, there was too many around here, and then I found that they were all full of fail. Yeah, uh, her her theory is that you like intensely study each group and get to know them, and and you know if you've spent like a day with their people and you're not feeling it, then poof, move on. Um, because yeah. Just getting to know different pagans helps. Being at festivals helps. Could take my approach. Fight it kicking and screaming. And buy an RV so we all accost you to take us to pagan events. I mean, it might even be that it was a path that you had experienced early on and didn't find a resonation with. And then all of a sudden, as you go back to it, you find, hey, you know, this all of a sudden makes a lot more sense. You know, as you grow, sometimes your path is not ready for you. Or sometimes the other way around, you are not ready for your path. So eventually one will come to you. But, you know, like Dave said, and like everybody, go out and experience. You're not going to find it sitting home and going, woe is me, I can't find a path, what am I ever to do? You know, one thing, because I, I, I've had someone who's who's asked me about specific paths, and they're, they're like really dead set on this like one particular path. And one thing that I've discovered, especially over the past year, is that even though I'm a Wiccan, I find that I have so much in common with people from different pagan religions. 
that, you know, if I found myself in a community where where the only group around was a Hellenismus group, uh, a, a group of Greek Reconstructionists, um, I already know from interactions I've had with other pagans that their values are close enough to mine that I would be happy to 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 join them and in group with them. I'm 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 Wiccan at heart. I'm happy to be Wiccan, but you know, sometimes you just sort of have to realize that for a large part, a lot of us have a lot of the same basic values. And so sometimes you have to just go with the people that feel like family rather than the window dressing that, that suits your style. If that made any sense. I'm sorry, guys. I'm starting to fade. No, it made sense. I actually think the path finds you when you're not looking for it. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot of truth to that. I ended up in my current tradition right after I had vowed that I would have nothing to do with Wicca ever again. But I'm bum. Now look where you are. Famous. Yeah, and look at Scurvy. He actually wound up at CNC PPD despite everything that happened on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if only that camera first. wouldn't have stopped rolling. <laughs> okay. So this last one we're going to have fun with. Oh, no. Yeah. How do you know if you're born a witch? Do you have a birthmark? Do you have some kind of superpowers? Anything? <laughs> there's, a, there's a rather distinct odor. <laughs> <laughs> you always smell like cucumbers. Turn people into newts. I thought it was Nog Champa. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave, that's hippies. <laughs> yeah, fucking ah. hippies. Well, that's you know, patchouli. Born a witch. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with Peter. I think it's patchouli. <laughs> I'll go with patchouli. Oh, I thought he sneezed. <laughs> Which actually lends to the question, Do are some people born with psychic ability? Do some people develop psychic ability? Is a psychic ability latency inherent in what we do? Or is it just that we choose not to put the blinders on that everyone else thinks we should wear? Um, I personally think that witchcraft is a faith it's a religion it's not it's not genetic we aren't born with the wizard gene as opposed to the muggle gene <laughs> um really um so i really think that you might be born with the latent ability to harness the magic that we embrace and recognize but that doesn't mean you're born a witch some people are born good actors some people are born good musicians um like um once head of acting that they can't teach you how to act they can only teach you how to enhance the skill that you already have if you don't they're completely wasting their time. Um, I don't think you're born to be a witch, um, which, of course, brings us to the question of fate versus genetics, eek. Um, but it's a religious choice to me, not like being born gay, which is, I think, somewhere in the brain chemistry, you know. Okay, rambling over. Uh, you know, I, I disagree. I, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It, I, I'm I'm gonna jump on a soapbox and I'm gonna jump right back off of it. I won't be long. Um, you know, this is sort of the pagan version of Calvinism. Whether you have free will, whether you have fate, and uh, and you know, even as a Christian, I wasn't very fond of Calvinism. Calvinism says that you know. God decides whether you go to heaven or hell before you're born, and you don't have crap to do about it, but, oh, you still have to obey the rules. Um, so, I'm not, I'm not crazy about that, and I've heard a lot of really passionate arguments made about, you know, people who are born um, witches, and, you know, what I think it is, is I think that 
I think that the gods can claim us, and I think that our ancestors can claim us. But uh, but saying that you're you're born uh, to a particular religious path, I think <laughs> I think sets up a sense of entitlement, where you know uh, you know maybe you had to study, but I was born a witch. And and I think I think that's I think that's a false sense of entitlement. I think I think everyone who comes to this should come to it as a student who has to learn everything. You know, uh, there shouldn't be this sense of you know, well, it's it's innately bred in me. Um, everybody has different talents, but you know, to say that your your fate has been cast before you were born uh, sort of negates the whole purpose of what we do, the the soul work that we do, the magic that we do. What what's the point? If if you don't have free will, um, I have to completely and utterly disagree. I I think some people are born with talent, and to say that it's it's a matter of you, Star. You're you're saying if if I've gotten this straight, you're saying that people cannot be born to a certain religion, and and with that statement, I completely agree, but. I think the religions have grown around certain abilities that people do have. I mean, I've seen too many of my own people who a certain family is known, the family itself is known for having a certain type of ability. Um, and and it's, it's evidence from you know, this person and that person and, and, and these generations upon generations having that ability or gaining abilities through intermarrying or losing ab abilities through intermarrying. Um, I, I don't see this t going to the level of fate or, or any of that. I, I think it's, there are certain things that, that are genetically there, um, so I, just, I I I have to disagree with both of you. I think it could be very easily both. I think that there are some people who are born with um, certain abilities or on a certain path. I know that I've had enough of experiences where. If I stray too far, something usually comes and whacks me upside the head and put, puts me right back where I should be. Whether it's, you know, things keep going wrong until they force me into a different situation. Whether it's ancestors, whether it's deities. I, either way, there is, there is something that I feel like I've, I've been sent, set to accomplish. And that's fine with me. Um, like Star was saying, uh, but the, the sense of entitlement, um, I think there's a whole misunderstanding that even though you may feel that you're born to do things or born with certain abilities, it doesn't make you any better. It just makes you different. And I think that we've lost that in a lot of aspects of a lot of our society that you may be born with this mutant ability to do calculus by the time you are two you know does that mean that you don't have to go to school no you still have to go to school and you still have to learn to interact with people and morals and english and social studies you know, they may put you in a different set and you may learn differently, but you still have to learn those things. If It's the same thing if you're born with a gift. I know um, my family had never really said anything about anybody really having gifts, and yet here I am, a lot different than most of my family members. Is that like, oh, sent from the heavens? Eh, who cares? It's not that one would be better, one would be worse. It's not that the people who learn and don't notice anything when they're young and they get pulled when they're older are any different. Well, not any better. Yes, they're different. But that's it. It can be 
both. And I think that we've forgotten that we need to respect both of those because they are both present. You, you know, something you and Lamika have said, I, I sort of realized where, where, where our wires are kind of crossed at is I'm looking at it as a, as a religious identity, but you guys are talking about gifts. And up here in, you know, the hills and hollers of Appalachia, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are born with certain gifts. Um, I know a lady who can cure poison ivy and poison oak by, by rubbing the infected spot and reciting psalms over it. Um, and, and like psychic gifts and so forth, I don't see that so much as being a religious thing or even necessarily being a witch thing. So I think I'm looking at it more from like, this is a religious path, and I don't think you can be bo- you can be born into like a family that's religious, but I don't think you could be born into born to a religion. Um, but I, I totally agree with what you guys say about gifts, um, uh, psychic gifts, and magical gifts that that those can be passed down um, through families and genetically. Um, I just wasn't, I, I wasn't looking at it from that point of view. I mean, the, the real trouble comes from the, the word witch itself. I mean, people look at it, some people look at it as a job title. Some people look at it, it like Star, you were saying, in a, a religious sense. And um, I've, I've met people who, there's no doubt in my mind after meeting them that I know in the sen- you know, in, in the cliched sense of the word, which that yeah, they were born that way, um, and they're they are forces to be reckoned with, and um, it, I I don't know I, I, I see I. I even want to go so far as to maybe say, no, you're not born into a religion as in, you know, yes, you can be born into a family that's religious, but I still feel that some people are born to a faith path, whether they choose to accept it. I know that I would have never chosen the deities that came to me and have kind of push their weight around you know it is it has always been like that um it's not something that I went out looking for it's just was always what it was you know just a observation and a question real quick and a question I know I can't get an answer to but it's for this person observation is is that is an intimate question mm. any answer you get from somebody on that is either going to be very academic which that's pretty bland problem I will say is worthless well not quite worthless or it's going to be very personal they might abstract to some and <clears throat> Oh, there's somebody typing, and I just totally lost my train of thought. Some people I've met think that they are born a witch, and then some people say it's just something that they do. But thinking back over the ones who's who's said each one, the ones who claim to be born witches really are the ones who are just role-playing. Those people who like to keep all these various witchy things around the house so they can make the house look witchy and have the ones who say they were born from witches and their grandmothers are witches and so on. Whereas those people who actually practice the work every day, um, practice, do, perform, whichever, it's not that they were born into this special ability. It's just something that they do. It's like a second job almost or a... And if you want it, it's a personal calling as opposed to some kind of inherently um, born with ability or something. So I think that the ones who claim to be born a witch 
are the ones who are really making it up and putting on airs, and the ones who just do witchcraft are the ones who are who don't need to wear the fancy costume and all that. You know, to, to just sort of put in what my position is into perspective, you know, I was born into a Baptist family. I was born to a Baptist minister. I was born to a long line of Baptists. Um... And I, I, I think there's a very good possibility that had not certain events happened in my life, I, I would be Baptist right now. Oh. But um, <laughs> but I, I do feel that I'm very strongly called by my ancestors, and I feel very strongly that I'm called by my gods. Um, but I've never, I've never once had the feeling that I was, I was born to, to be. Uh, a, a witch or to a particular spiritual path, maybe to a particular um, spiritual leaning. You know, I might be like a, you know, more of a folk witchy kind of Christian. But uh, I am. Um, so, yeah, so I get the calling thing, too. But uh, I don't I don't know. I mean, if, if I were if I were to be completely honest, if I were born to something it seems pretty plausible to me that I was probably born to be a Southern Baptist. Um, and, and that's just sort of the way I, I kind of look at it. But, um, but yeah, this is a good conversation. Yeah, I, I, kind of, I kind of think that the whole, like, being born into a religion is kind of a bull, bunch of bull. Um, you know, it's, you are a result of how you are raised and the environment you are exposed to. And there is no, yes, there might be a god gene. Okay, so that just flips you on or off whether or not you're religious. But that doesn't tell you what religion you are. And the rest is kind of, you know, how you've been raised and what have you been exposed to. You know, Star was exposed to Google. <laughs> mm. And now she is Wiccan. You know, and, you know, there's lots of people that are just not exposed to things. And then they discover, oh, okay. Well, maybe I am pagan. I just never had a need for that spirituality. But I mean, mm. people believe what they believe. But I think this whole, like, I think this whole thing got started because the pagan community is so intertwined with the GLBT community, and yeah, people are born gay. But then people have started being like, "I'm born Wiccan." Well, I'm born belligerent. Well, I'm born to be an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> nope. so people oh, took this, like, yes, I'm you are, born Dave. To be, you know, completely freaking too far. I think this is just a result of that. You know, I, I, cover all of us. <laughs> well, some of it is, though. I mean, you know, what Miles said about how some people who, who say that are, are doing it because, honestly, they're twits and, you know, they're mental, then, yeah, they're, they're kind of easy to, to pick out. And, and you're, you, whether you're a GLBT community or you're pagan or or christian or whatever you're always going to get poser assholes who make you guys look bad that's the plague of the human race um on the converse of that though ask a rabbi if people are born jewish or not i've heard long debates about that Mm -hmm. yeah but that's a religious belief well, that's also an ethnicity, though. It, that's sort of complex. That's true. That's complex. But, you know, I, I kind of agree with what Dave says. I do think that it's absolutely correct that people are born religious. I, well. I, 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 think, I think that there are people who are just born religious, and that's just how they are. And I think there are people who are born who are just not religious, and that's just who they are from birth. Um, well, so to, I can get that. Something to keep in mind, though, when you bring up the Jewish question is mm. the Jewish people are descendants from a culture that's from an entirely different perspective than what we're than what we're even used to thinking it. Ethnicity, yeah. Yes. Here it's the modern day and age and we're gonna use uh America. Granted even though the predom or the majority of religion here is Abrahamic in nature we're still used to thinking in very secular terms by comparison you go back two, three, four, five thousand years your nationality was also your religion was also your ethnicity 
Yep, and the other two would be the first ones to bring it up because when they try to do some anthropological studies to figure out what their religion and how it was practiced, yeah, country and religion are the same word, quite literally. So, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, it's your heritage, it's your blood, it's your people, it's it's all of that into one, and and that's another issue. This question also deals with the issue within the neo pagan community that people are trying to divorce and slice and dice pagan faiths from the culture with you know whether culture it's culture of origin or culture created you know how you know dave was talking about psg earlier now there's you know children's children's are children going to psg um you can't the problems that the neo-pagan community is running into some of them involve this division and chopping and castrating of faith from heritage. And then again, also we'll looking at, and I've, it's just a rough rule of thumb that I've been noticing is when it comes to uh, the whole reli- the whole ethnicity religion and uh, nationality you can pretty much always count on two out of the three say uh, upper Egypt conquer lower Egypt conquers upper Egypt la da 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 and they start worshiping Egyptian gods yeah they might not have the same ethnicity but they're worshiping the same deities and after a while it'll kind of sort of blend some genetically, some just an acceptance. Same thing happened with the Greeks, the Romans. Boy, did it happen with the Christians, but let's not go there. Well, you know, I don't, I don't have a drop of Mediterranean blood in me, to my knowledge. I have I, no, no Greek blood in me whatsoever. No Greek uh, ancestry. I'm, I'm whiter than Wonder Bread. Um, I, I seriously am. I'm, I'm all Northern European. Um, and I'm, I'm very devoted to Hephaestus, and, uh, so that sort of, that's, what Lamika's talking about is something that, that I, I think about a lot, and I also think about, you know, I have a very small amount of, of Cherokee ancestry, and I, I live on land that belonged to the, the Cherokee Nation, um, and, and so as part of that, I honor Selu, and I feel very self-conscious about that, and I'm very careful to, to make sure that I honor respect that because I, I, I am wider than Wonder Bread. And, and I try to be very careful in, in my relationship with Hephaestus as well because I'm, I'm not Greek um, in, in any way, shape, or form. Oh. But, um, but one interesting thing that happened at PantheaCon um, was when they had the, the uh, Hindu... Uh, or Hindus pagan or pagans Hindu thing, and uh, it, just just having the Hindu American Foundation there was was sort of fascinating. But one of the questions that came up was a woman who had Native American ancestry asked them about cultural appropriation and how they felt about that. And their answer was that if you're if you're seeking out our gods uh, uh, in in a spiritual manner, then please go for it. But please just don't make money off of our religion. So you know. <laughs> It's it's I understand not cutting things off from their culture and and doing things that aren't necessarily in tune with your heritage, but then, you know, there's also if people are honestly searching and reaching out and trying to do things in a responsible way, um, you know, I, I I think we have to embrace that to some degree. Well, here's this funny thing about heritage, and it's it can be passed down through more than just bloodlines. Now you look at Greece. Greece and later Rome built the foundations, which is a large part of pretty much all Western societies. So if you wanted to say that we have heritage that goes back to Greece, yes, you can make that argument. You might not have the genetics, but when you speak, a lot of our language comes from Greece comes from Rome 
the gods we worship, especially many people, there's influence there. The rituals, I mean, it's... It's that... The it's hard to is a great point. <laughs> it's hard, I mean, it's hard to say right there that you don't have that heritage. If you speak English, even as a second language, Greece and Rome has influenced you. If you live on the planet Earth in this day and age, unless you're really far out there, Greece and Rome has influenced you. And even if you are really far out there, I'm just as a side note, Macedonia, even though it was Hicksville, Greece, and not really acknowledged for the most part, Alexander the Great did march all the way out to India. So, yeah. We've... That's a heritage right there. At least in that little piece right there, we can all say that we share them. Mm. Alrighty. Rant's done. <laughs> Scurvy has a really, really, really good point because it's... The heritage we share doesn't necessarily have to be a blood one. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean that, okay, so if you're not Greek, then star, then you can't worship Hephaestus, because that's bullshit. That connection is there. Um, it's, do you have the respect? Do you have the, the truth and, and faith behind it to help create new culture and new heritage that makes that work you know what I mean yeah I think so I can see that are you ready there's too much quiet here all right, we've been at this for close to two hours. I think it's time for final thoughts after these messages, and we're back. Final thoughts. Yes, everybody who's an adult listening to this, spend one week and open a history book. It's an entirely different experience when you're not being graded on it. I really don't have much of a final thought this week. I am painting feathers for Pow Wow. Yay, Pow Wow. Pow Wow is April the 30th through... May 1st. 1st. Out in the Outer Banks. Just find the, the furthest point out in the ocean. And that's where we're going to be. Frisco. I'm going to bring the fail boat and everything. Yay! I might even get ambitious and make sushi. It depends on how my schedule goes. Food? Yeah, I know when Pow Wow comes along, you tend not to have much of a schedule. You just tend to be, oh my god, everything needs to be done three days ago. <laughs> yeah, I pretty much already figured that, like, what I'm going to do is give you guys money and tell you, go, go shopping for what you want for dinner. And then I will be working at the museum, Help make her. stuff. Okay, just don't let Brandon touch it. <laughs> Me and Scurvy can alternate Aww. cooking as long as it's stuff I can cook and I won't kill anyone. Okay, and I have a I have a nice gas stove, so. Yay, gas stove! Hey. This is a rambling final thoughts, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, I must think that of all the various questions you've addressed this evening, the most enjoyable one was a question about the presumed ritual with the broken glass and the pictures in a circle. Um, but the most profound discussion we had was about the implications of being born a witch or being born with gifts or penalties and things. Um, but my um, elective answer of all these various questions is that it can all come back to 
research what you feel is right and then 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 try to examine how you feel about what you've researched or or if you're a mother and you're pregnant and you really want to top off this discussion give birth inside hmm. a circle of glass <laughs> well um no but I see <laughs> That's annoying. Um, <laughs> a very big circle of glass. Okay, here's a million-dollar question. If a baby is delivered at a pagan festival, I know it's happened. Are they born a witch? It depends. Were they also conceived there? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're definitely born to have a preference for tie-dye. <laughs> <laughs> That's our national flag, you know. You know, my my final thought is that um, thank the gods for post production because this is just going to sound so much more polished and together once the PCP crew works. I feel bad for Joe. I actually <laughs> got this one. Ashley yeah, got this episode. Yeah, I do feel bad for me. A lot of stupid fell out of my mouth tonight. I don't think it <laughs> that's was okay. That's for just your ethnicity talking. <laughs> <laughs> my final thought is it's a good thing I like the people at PCP otherwise I'd already be asleep by now <laughs> yay. yay uh my final thought is that uh this has got to be the m most serious effing discussion I've ever heard on P PCP and you guys are all Amazing, amazing people. I love you all. Yay. We love you too, Lamika. Yay, quick, everybody hug. My Yay. final thought is I got sick over the weekend. I fell off the face of the earth. And in my honor of everyone thinking I was dead, they all decided to stir up shit in the pig community. And I am glad to have these people as friends. <laughs> <laughs> I have sure you know, I call carry on, carry on. <laughs> I have you know, I called every hospital in your city. <laughs> you realize I don't actually live in Houston, right? So? <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to know what to call it. <laughs> he just wants to put every hospital, you know, on speed dial, just in case. You know, Dave, I almost well, in a city 10 miles away from where I want to actually be, like, you know, going to the hospital. He refused to engage in Geek Speak, then disappeared for days. Yes, I was calling the hospitals. Well, if you were to call me, in addition to Star, I'd realize people were panicking. But when just Star calls me, I'm like, oh, it's just Star calling. Gee, thanks, Dave. Aww. I can feel love. You know, I almost let you die once. You know, don't think I won't almost let you die again. Well, actually, Dave, you have to think about it this way. If Star's asking if you're okay... How about this, Star? Next time, don't ask me, are you okay in a text message? Ask, are you dead? I will probably <laughs> reply to that one. <laughs> I, will, I will keep this in mind. However, at PSG, when you're, like, slumped over your chair, if you're still holding a Gatorade, I will be like, oh, he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Star. I'll help you out with that. Oh. I nominate Star Navigator. This should be good. Well, she actually knows how to navigate. We'll I can navigate. I can oh. navigate. We will get there on time. You may be. You may be sorry that I'm coming with you. <laughs> so, yes, I may make y'all pee in a bottle. We will get there on time. <laughs> uh, Scurry doesn't mind. He likes building up biological weapons. Oh, man, we still got to edit that out. <laughs> that is so, all kinds of nasty. Hey, it's not my fault that kid thought it was a good idea to break into my house. I promise Especially you, he is now floor, adequately he's conditioned. The <laughs> There's the word traumatized. <laughs> Speaking of traumatized, is Londa still around? Yeah. yeah, I just had to uh, go deal with a semi-hysterical baby for a little while. Ah, baby. Oh. He's sick. Um, he's finally asleep again. 
Is he sleeping yeah. better through the night yet? Or especially he, not because he's sick? Well, he was, and now he's sick, so he's kind of all shut. <laughs> Poor little guy. RSV is not good for babies. No. And Barrett of Canada, do you have any final thoughts? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much said everything that I really had meaning to say. All right, well, that's it for this thrilling and exciting extended episode of PCP, the Pagan Center Podcast. We'll see you all next week when we talk about working with Something non-human else. entities. I actually remember Yay. next week's topic for once. Woo! Yay. So we'll be back Seth. next week with some non-human entities. And no, it is not an other kin episode. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. 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 Good night.